You're, you're, you're tuned into the stellar, stellar award winning internet radio station. You're at the right place at the right time. Yes, Lord Radio. Hold up. Wait just a minute. It's Roz on your radio. Yo. Keep it locked right here. Showcase fellowship inspired. Show, 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 show. show. Showcase. Hey, it's Roz on your radio. Show, 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 showcase. Showcase fellowship inspired. Yes, Lord Radio. Now it's time for another Yes, Lord Radio exclusive. Hey, everybody. It's Roz on the radio, and you're listening to another YLR exclusive. My guest today is manager and promoter for national gospel artists and plays, as well as a speaker, preacher, and author. Dr. Veryl Howard is here with us to give us a behind-the-scenes look into the industry, the ministry, and how to get out of poverty. Um, but first, Dr. Howard, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me today, Roz. I'm excited to share whatever is inside of me to give to your listeners. Thank you, and we are so glad to have you. Now, before we go any further into talking about um, the ministry, I have to ask um, about your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your hair when I when I first saw the photos and some of the videos. I said, "Wow, her hair is beautiful." So I have to ask because I think all the ladies are going to be thinking the same thing um, once they uh, hear this. Um, they're going to want to know what do you do to your hair, girl? This is nothing but God. At the <laughs> age of twelve, <laughs> I started. I started getting white patches all over my hair at the age of 12. And then when I became 16 and got away from home, I started dyeing my hair. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody in my family, all of my siblings, we all have had snow white hair. And then what ended up happening, you know, by working in the industry, I thought white hair wasn't hip. So I was dying it all those years. And then God said to me it was my glory and to stop dying it. So now Mm -hmm. I have finally I've embraced it. And so what I try to do, I'm at the beauty parlor right now, Rosalind. I try to <laughs> rock it. I, you know, I'm wearing a white mohawk, and I just try to work with it the best I can. Bush, balls, you name it. Yeah. And um, you know, just embrace who God has made me to be. Awesome. Now, you are you wear your hair natural, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I have decided that when I got older, I did not want to be bald. And Amen. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, Lord, you got to show me how to work this. I've been blessed with a beautician that she studies my hair. She told me today she's already studied my style so it can look a certain way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I'm trying to take good care of it. And just I just want to be versatile with it. And I want it to be thick and full. So I just let the terms go. All right. Now, what do you do to keep to keep it Snow White? Well, my beautician, uh, you know, it's so interesting you would say that because, I mean, I almost want to put her on the phone. <laughs> we had a trial. We had a trial with this because I can't grease. I can't use grease to have color in it. Mm-hmm. My vitamins, if they have color in it, it comes out through my pores and it turns my hair different colors. Mm. Gel, if they have color in it, I can't put the gel on my hair because it turns it different colors. So what she has to do to keep it white is she almost has to continuously strip it because some of my vitamins, I do Zumba like five times a week. They come out of my pore and they turn my hair greenish yellow. Oh, wow. So she has to take it through. Yes, ma'am. And, you know, she studied me. I thought she studied my hair. So I, she has to uh, take it through a process to lift it back up and strip it of all the, the stuff that has come out of me on my sweat. <laughs> I see. Okay, well, okay, that's a process that other fellow beauticians would know more about. But anyway, I love the look on you, and I'm sure other people are probably oh, thinking the oh, same oh. thing. So I really like that. Um, but let's get into it. Um, this is probably one of those chicken and egg questions. I'm not sure, but you can let me know what came first, the ministry or the industry? Oh, my goodness. Wow, that is a chicken and egg question because <laughs> if I'm going to take it, if I'm going to take it biblically, the, the Bible says in Jeremiah 1 and 5 that God knew me when I was being called from my mother's womb. Yeah. Now, the thing is, I didn't know I was called. So if we're going to go by what I thought, I thought the business aspect came first because I was working in the secular industry before Mm -hmm. I started working in the gospel industry. And then when I figured out that I was called into ministry, then the ministry became first. Mm -hmm. And everything I did with respect to business, I had to make sure that it lined up properly with what God was ordering for me from a ministry perspective. Right. I like that. And so 
you've worked with numerous people in the industry. You've worked on numerous projects. Um, I don't want to get into all the name dropping, but um, a number of people have benefited from your knowledge and from your skill. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll be honest with you, Rosalind, about 40 pounds ago and about 10 years ago, I used to model professionally. Okay. And um, I used to go out to casting calls. Maybe 15 years ago, I used to go out to casting calls and everything because I was in my 20s. Uh-huh. And I got, I got tired of being in casting call lines where someone was determining my fate. You know, you, right. you, you, and you. I'm, I might not have been skinny enough. might not have been tall enough. Maybe my hair was the wrong color. I hadn't dyed it enough that day. So I got tired of that. And God said, you know, I'm putting you on the other side of the fence. So what happened was I started working in the industry uh, as a casting director. I was working with movies as a casting director and an AD with a, a good friend of mine. Okay. And um, eventually I got saved. And when I got saved, the Lord told me to give it all up. Give the movie business up, give the TV business up. And so when I got saved, then I started working in plays. So I worked with Tyler Perry. I worked with uh, David Talbert. I probably worked on over 20 plays, marketing, promotion, doing casting. And, you know, so then that opened up the door to having contact with gospel singers. Right. And so the singers... The singer said, okay, well, if you can market a play or you can manage a play, then my career, I know you can handle that, you know, because I was responsible for making sure I did radio buys, TV buys, making sure the street kings were in place, make sure I did auditioning, make sure I did publicity. So the artist said, well, you know, I want you on my team. And so it evoluted into me working one-on-one with many of the gospel artists. And that's how it changed. Yes, ma'am. So you just kind of fell into it. Kind of fell into it. You know, I believe it was always destined for me. Mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to do entertainment, but I thought that I was going to be on the other side of the entertainment. Right. I was modeling and acting. And I even, you know, later on became an acting coach to a lot of aspiring um, actors and actresses. But, you know, God is something else, Rob, because I gave all the TV and film business up for God. And mm-hmm. he told me he would put back in that industry at the appointed time, and now I'm managing a film producer. So it's just amazing what God will do when we're obedient. Now, just shifting into something else, um, we've heard many people say, you know, put God first, family second, and, and when they talk about family, they're talking about specifically put that spouse first. Put the children second and then the third would be everything else. Um, I was in a discussion uh, with a friend and we touched on the idea that perhaps many people confuse that God first with putting the church first or that God first is uh, maybe directly linked to their attendance and participation in a local church. And so I know that... um, While that is part of making God first, I believe that's not the only part of it. And I'm mentioning this because you mentioned that the body of Christ must link together globally and that the spirit of religiosity has bound God's people too long. I want to just touch on what does that mean? What does that look like? And in what ways can we rise above a spirit of religiosity? Well, I feel very strongly about a religious spirit, very strongly about that Pharisee and Sadducee spirit where we habitually go to church and we make it almost, we make it almost like a program where we know between these hours we're going to be in church. We know we're going to get out at 11 o'clock. We know this, that, and the other. And we habitually do our church work. But just because we habitually do that does not mean we have a relationship with God. And so what has happened is the body of Christ has governed their relationship the way they feel their relationship should be, but not the way God may have given us the pattern for it to be. So then we function in a spirit of religiosity. Yeah. And when you say when you say put God first, see a lot of people are so busy in their church with their church duties, they don't have time to pray. They don't even have time to cook for their children. They don't have time to fast. They're so busy running behind their assignment for some folks for uh, prioritized positioning or status quo or whatever it may be. Yeah. 
So they, they function without no anointing. They're angry when they're there. You know, yeah. somebody come in and, and you, you, you're being judged, with, you know, when they look at you or things along that nature. So the love of God is not always present because we're being so busy and we're not having a relationship. Mm-hmm. So then inadvertently, we start birthing churches with no power. The anointing is not there. The glory is not there. It's a bunch of busybody people. I'm in the choir. Yeah. But you fasted up and prayed up for singing that Sunday. Can you prophetically sing? Well, I'm a preacher. Can you prophetically preach? I'm a dancer. Can you prophetically dance? Are you just dancing and preaching and singing with the oil of God? Mm-hmm. And religiosity does not allow that. Religiosity is habitual behavior. Yeah, I go to church, Bible study on Wednesday. Yeah, I go to church on Sunday. So where is God to be free to move in all of that? Exactly. But, you know, other people, they say that God is there because you are participating in these activities and they look at people who are not participating in these activities in a different light. That's a judgmental spirit. That's a judgmental spirit. That's a therapy and savagery mentality. Let me just give you an example, Rob, because I'm kind of radical. When I, I told my church, I said, I, I don't want to do a 12 o'clock midnight service. Mm-hmm. It looked at me like I was crazy. I said, well, at 12 o'clock, Somebody is going to be in some tight clothes. Somebody's going to be getting high. Somebody's going to be clubbing. Somebody's going to be picking somebody up at the club. Somebody's going to be walking the beat. I said, so let's hit that hour and try to get them in the house of the Lord. Right. And because it wasn't the norm, you feel me? Mm-hmm. Because it didn't fit the religious mold. Then I was looked at as being crazy. Well, no, we can't do it at 12 o'clock. And then I said, well, okay, I need some of you all to come hang out with me at the club outside. Now, I know who I am. I know I'm living. I know I'm saved. I know I love God. I'm not going to the club to go inside and drink, party, pick a man up. I did that 15, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm going out to radically to try to get somebody saved. And so when I ask people to go with me, come on, come on, to, you know, in front of the club. Let's talk to the gangbanger coming out who's getting high. I'm not insulted if he's cussing at me while I'm trying to minister about the Lord. I know who I am in God. But folks looked at me like I'm crazy. And see, now the church, God has always had a mandate on his disciples to get out the four walls of the church. Mm-hmm. So when we, when we get a habitual behavior, we don't get out and go in the deep like God has commanded us to do, to go in them dirty streets, to walk the streets with the prostitutes, to go with the gangbangers, to go in the prison. We don't do that like God has mandated us to do because we get comfortable looking at each other every Sunday and every Wednesday. So you don't want to ask me questions about religiosity. Mm. So what can we do to rise above that? People, Some people are stuck in it. Well, with all so far... Folks are falling by the wayside. They don't want to come to church anymore. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing a dying of churches. You're seeing, because we're not, we're not going, we're getting full. We're sitting in church and we're getting full, but we're not releasing what God has called us to release to get somebody else set free and deliver. And they mm-hmm. may not come in the church doors. Originally, you may have to go down that street. You don't right. want to go to because them boys are standing on in that corner selling some drugs. Yeah. And God has made us and anointed us to be bold enough to be able to do that. So the church, we have got to rise up. The remnants got to rise up. We got to hit the four ends of the earth because you're looking at all these catastrophic things that are going on. Something is flipping in the body of Christ. We got to get back on the prayer wall. We got our intercessors need to come. Our intercessors have to come forth. We have to stop being so concerned with the biggest choir, the biggest building, the best outfit, this, that, and the other. We got to get back to the foundation and why God even called us to do this. Or we're not going to win this thing. That's right. Let's talk about some of the uh, ministry work that you're doing first. Tell us about um, that ministry. And I um, I understand you will actually be doing some traveling as a part of that ministry work as well. Yes, ma'am. God told me in, in uh, January, pretty much uh, God elevated me into the apostleship. Mm-hmm. And uh, God told me that he had called his disciples to go out. There was a mandate. In this hour, it is an urgency for us to come out of those four walls. Mm-hmm. So the ministry is called Hand to Hand Global Ministry, and it's an outreach ministry that is driven towards um, 
going going to this earth, walking this earth, taking prayer warriors, taking in, you know intercessors, preachers, dancers, singers, to to travel all over the globe, whether it's in the United States, out of the United States, to be a helping hand to those that are in need. We're going in the regions and we're just going to pray. We're going in some regions and we're just going and taking goods and you know school supplies and things along that nature. Mm-hmm. Some regions we're going in and we're going to the prison. So this trip that we have coming up, it's about uh, 15, 15 leaders going with me, apostles and pastors and some singers, or maybe 20. And we're going to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We're coupled up with the government, and we're literally going over there taking supplies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that island has uh, 37% aid, and um, the, the, the government has been crying out. Mm-hmm. A lot of countries rely on America for their economy, and you know our economy has been uh, stifled at this right. point. So a lot of other countries live in, in, in conditions we could never imagine, Rod. Mm-hmm. Never imagine. Mm-hmm. I've seen kids living in mud, huts almost in Africa. So we're going as an apostolic team to hit all those areas, schools, prisons, homeless people, hospitals, the, the religious leaders, the political leaders, and we're going to render hope. And we're not going over there to take anything from them. We're going to take Jesus Christ with us. And that's the mandate that God has given me globally Mm -hmm. to pull prayer warriors and leaders together to speak to the earthly realm and to speak to places where our people are desolate and hopeless because they're tired of going in the four walls of the church, not seeing the power of God, not seeing people delivered, healed, set free, not understanding how to fight against the warfare, the strongholds, the sit over regions, and we have a mandate to go in and undergird and to pray them through those situations. I love it. I love it. So if somebody wants to do just what you're saying that you're doing, where where would that person start? How do you decide um, that this is the place that you want to go? Well, to be honest with you, with respect to me, I can only speak on my perspective. Mm -hmm. Years ago, years ago, I heard a cry coming from the earth. I heard a cry from different regions, and God said, I'm sending you there. He said, but this is not about you. This is about the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I need you to connect with other remnants, other kingdom-minded people who don't care about having another preaching day under their belt. You feel me on this one? Who don't care about getting dirty, or who don't care about sleeping in certain conditions. And I need you to pull those who doesn't care about praying 48 hours straight, you know, in Chicago, or wherever we got to go. Mm -hmm. And so when I start hearing the cry of different countries and different states and different places, God said, gather the people together. So I put a, I put a, a news flash, you know, that we're going to these various places, various countries, various cities, and people started answering to the call. Mm-hmm. Because they had the same burning inside of them. And see, God wants us to be connected together as the remnants and the children of God. And the body of Christ right now, we have too many schisms and isms against each other when God needs us to unite yes. and be powerful to pull down these strongholds. Um, let's talk about the book, which is very interesting to me. The book is titled, God is My Ticket Out of the Ghetto. And I absolutely agree with that. I know that Jesus has promised us an abundant life. He's promised us a level of abundance, but many people are, of course, living below that. Uh, Tell us about the book and what are some things that we can do to break free from the ghetto that you're talking about? Well, what happened was, even in my own life, the ghetto means sectional. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a sectional mentality. God would tell me I'm healed. And I'm like, really, God? Today it doesn't look like I'm healed. Am I really healed? Mm -hmm. And then I would listen to somebody else tell me something else. Or God would tell me, I'm going to do something like this with you in your business. I'm like, for real, God? Because my bank account was saying zero. Are you really going to do this? (laughs) And then, you know, I've had experience where I've gone and laid before the Lord, and then all of a sudden, instantaneously a check would come. You know, so God had to work on me and tell me my mindset had to be renewed. I had to be refreshed. I had to be regenerated. And I had to be detoxed because my mindset had become infected with what the world was telling me I could not do. And I mean, that world even encompassed some of the people in the body of Christ yeah. who thought the promises and the dreams were too big. Like, God couldn't do that. And right. I would listen to them. 
And so God said, write the book down because you're not the only one who thinks like that. There's some people I've given some dreams to sit right up in the church. There's some Christian folks, some remnants. I told them they're going to do impossible things. But the spirit of doubt, the spirit of sabotage, the spirit of distraction, some haterade, some haterade mm-hmm. out in their ear. Mm-hmm. And so now they're sitting there thinking that they can't write that film. They can't write that play. They can't own that radio station. They can't own, you know, that TV station. God said, write that book. So I wrote that book based on Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because okay. if your if God's desire was, in the beginning, God told Genesis and Adam, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He was not just talking about baby. Right. He was talking about in everything. Be fruitful and multiply. Mm-hmm. So we had to be realigned in our thought process to hear God, trust God, and be fruitful and multiply in the gifts God has put inside of us. Well, the funny thing about it, too, is that, you know, just like you're saying, you're you're speaking some things to yourself, and then the next minute you're questioning the very thing that you said. We know that we're supposed to be the head, not the tail. We know that we're supposed to be the lenders and not the borrowers. But then when we go home and, and we get into that place of... um I don't know. I, I guess maybe um, the, the point before you become desperately and actively asking God, you know, for your um, for your place of comfort, um, we we get to that spot and we begin to think the very opposite of what we already know is is to be true. Yeah, we have a tendency to release out of the atmosphere of doubt. And God is calling us to have a, a, a closer dimension in our relationship with him. So even mm-hmm. when that spirit of doubt tries to show up, you're like, uh-uh, I'm not going there. I've been down that road before. I know what God told me. I know what he can do. I'm not receiving that. And we got to get to that point. You got to have tunnel vision. Right. And so I have just decided, Rod, well, I'm just going to have tunnel vision. Because all that God has for me to multiply, I'm going to do it. And I'm asking God to redeem the time for the time that I did doubt, I did question, I did disbelief. Because yeah. the enemy, see, the enemy, this is the problem with us as children of God. Mm-hmm. The enemy wants us to focus on the things we see. Yeah. And when we focus on the natural things that we see manifested in the natural, then we take our eyes off the spiritual component that's going to speak life and going to encourage us not to be distracted. So this is why I said we got to have tunnel vision on God. And then we got to speak life to it. We got to constantly speak life to ourselves because mm-hmm. every day there's something that he's trying to do to get us off track. Absolutely. Some of the enemy. Absolutely. Every day there's something. Mm. That's good stuff. I, I hope that somebody's really receiving this right now. Um, we got to get out of here. But before we do, of course, guys, let us know what you think. We're going to tell you in a minute how you can get your copy of the book and follow Dr. Howard. Of course, you can stay connected to me by visiting me at Facebook.com and Twitter.com slash Riles on the Radio. Also, check out the website for the recap of this show, RilesOnTheRadio.com. And Dr. Howard, how can everybody stay connected to you and find out more about this book in your ministry? Oh, wow. I have a web page. They can check me out on half, H-A-V-E, some, S-U-M, faith.com. That's, that's half some faith of a mustard seed. I like and that. And then, uh-huh. And then also, of course, I'm on Twitter. Twitter is Pastor V-H, and then also it's Pastor Verl. I try to keep up with Twitter. And then there's uh, a young lady by the name of Katrina McCray out of 37 Purple Management Company, she is responsible for my appearances and bookings and everything. And uh, her number is 214-907-8597. And, of course, you can Facebook me. I mean, we're in a social networking world, and I try to stay abreast of those different outlets. But you can just Google me, Facebook me, Twitter, you know, and you can find me. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And like Dr. Howard says, have some faith. Have some faith. 